Good afternoon and welcome to, to today's webinar, Business Innovation, Enhance Your Expertise with ICT Engagement. My name is Damien Harris from Griffith University and I'm your facilitator today. Alongside me, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Lee Ellen Potter, lecturer and researcher with Griffith University's School of Information and Communication Technology. Dr. Lee Ellen has, come, has worked extensively with industry and is now an industry liaison with Griffith University. This webinar will give you some insight into how a business can engage with our university to take advantage of the latest technological trends and processes. Some insights for today will be emerging technology, the Internet of Things and what are the opportunities for business, and the agile approach to project management and its application in non-IT based industries. We will also be discussing some easy and tangible collaborations that are available for businesses right now. First, some tips to get the most from today's session. We will be online for about 45 minutes and following the main presentation there will be opportunity for questions and answers. Please send through your questions to Dr Lee Allen using the text box on the screen. Following, following the session we will email all participants a copy of the presentation, a link and additional supporting information. So please check your inboxes later today. So now I'll hand over to Dr Potter to take you through today's webinar, Business Innovation, Enhance Your Expertise with ICT Engagement. Thanks Damien. Hi, as Damien said, my name is Lee Ellen Potter and I'm a lecturer at Griffith University. I have a background in the information technology industry where I worked as a business analyst and user experience consultant with everything from small companies to big consultancy groups in both the public and the private sectors. Now I run the industry project program at Griffith as well as teaching project management and user interface design and these are all areas where I have hands-on experience. A big focus in my teaching is to bridge the gap between the students I work with and the industry that they're about to step into. I want to make sure that when I send them out to you, they're ready to work with you as IT professionals. I also get to indulge my own interests through my research. I head the User and Societal Needs Research Group. Through this group, I get to work with both seasoned researchers and energetic research students and I get to play in the sandpit. This group looks specifically at how technology can be used to support people. We currently have projects looking at how technology can help young deaf children to learn sign language and we've got projects working with new and emerging technology. So pretty much everything I do in both my teaching and my research work in one way or another comes back to how we can use technology to support what we do. And today I'm going to be drawing on that to talk to you about how you can use IT to support your business and to innovate and to engage. Technology is now across all businesses. I'm really hard pressed to find an industry area that doesn't use IT. It used to be that areas like farming were technology free but not anymore. Some of the really big farms especially use sensor networks to monitor things like feed and water levels for stock and that saves them a day of riding around the holding manually checking everything. They can monitor the levels from their computers and they just go out to top up food and water when they need it. One of my students grew up on a farm and he was telling me the other day about some of the ideas he has for how technology could be used to make his dad's life easier. I see great innovation in his future. Okay, now while businesses generally understand that technology is everywhere, the knowledge of how best to apply it, that varies. You're all experts in your particular business, but not necessarily in technology or in what it can do for you and why should you be, especially if it's not a core part of your business. So today I'll talk a little bit about that and how you can still innovate and capitalise on what technology has to offer without having to be an expert. Of course, one of the things that IT people tend to love but that drives everyone else nuts is constant change. You've just gotten used to your new tablet technology and then the next generation comes out and you have to start all over again. So the emergence of new technology, it, it really is a constant in this industry and how you can make the most of that rather than living in fear of the newest upgrade or gadget, that's what we want to look at. I'm also going to talk about some of the innovations that are out there and what they might mean for you. So really all of this is just about giving you space to focus on your core business. You don't have to do it all yourself and you don't have to be across everything in IT. There's a range of collaboration options and available so I'll highlight some of those as well. Okay, so we all know that technology changes a lot and frequently. It 
could be that some of these new innovations have an opportunity to offer you, either directly through the tech itself or indirectly just by looking at possibilities. The key here is innovation, how you can be innovative in what you do in order to achieve a business goal. Now, in saying that, it's a good idea to know why you want to innovate. In business, innovation will be more successful if you actually have a goal that you want to achieve. You can always innovate just for the fun of it, but you probably want to think a little more strategically than that. So think about what you want to achieve. What is it that you do? And is there something that could be easier, more efficient, better in some way? Or is there an opportunity for you? Do you see some of the new tech coming out and see something that you could use it for in your own business? And if you do choose to innovate, how will you know if you've been successful? Hand in hand with the why, think about what success lo looks like. I mean specifically for you. Okay, right, with that said, what is the new tech? Okay, not all of these that I'm going to talk about are going to be relevant to you, but let's just have a look at some of what's out there. And I'm going to start with wearables. They become really popular and they're a fairly accessible technology if you're looking to innovate. Current wearables are usually armbands or watches and glasses are making inroads and at the risk of branding, think Fitbit, Apple Watch, Google Glass. Yeah. While people are still trying to figure out exactly what they're good for, at present most of them aim towards the fitness market or at ways to quickly present notifications. There is a school of thought that wearables are going to follow in the footsteps of tablets. Tablets have actually been around for decades, but it took the introduction of the iPad for them to suddenly leap to being a must-have technology. And there's suggestions that wearables may actually follow a similar track. So what's the opportunity for you? Some companies are using the fitness wearables to simply improve the health of their workforce, basically just capitalising on the devices themselves. Wearables actually gather an enormous amount of data about people, so it could be that this is something that's relevant to your business. The fact that they're wearable means that you could potentially have access to people all the time. Can this improve communication for you? What about productivity? Can you use it as part of a customer relationship strategy? Or can you see a further innovation for this technology? For instance, there's a big future in making wearables fashionable because no one wants to look like a twit while they're wearing them. There's also a really sophisticated version of wearables, uh, which is nanotechnology in clothes. You can then actually interact with your devices by simply touching your clothing. Uh, there's a variation on that, which is the transmitted interface. So the screen of your phone can literally be displayed on your arm from your watch using very clever little projector technology. And it'll include sensors that will actually recognise what you're doing as you touch the display on your arm. So these are some of the, the moves that are afoot in this area. Okay, let's have a look at some which are very much in the emerging category. Um, EEG headsets, that's that fancy looking headset you can see on the slide with all the buttons. This is really cutting edge. Um, Worn to allow you to interact with a computer and devices just by thinking. Even more intense is biotechnology. So this is technology that's integrated and it allows you to, con to control things with your brain. So companies such as Touch Bionics, they're an example. Uh, there's a photo here which shows bionics they've developed for people who have lost their limbs. And these bionics have enough finesse to allow really, really fine movements such that it would allow you to you know, brush your teeth, for instance. And there are more mainstream industrial applications for biotech as well, and that's in healthcare, in crop production, in agriculture, non-food uses of crops and other products, so biodegradable plastics, uh, vegetable oil, biofuels, there's environmental uses as well. If your business needs to work at the messy end of things, then there may be something that biotech can do that is going to make your life a little easier. Perhaps a more achievable emerging technology is augmented reality and virtual reality. Augmented reality uses existing technology such as phones or tablets and it literally augments what you can see on your screen with additional information. So augmented reality applications are programmed to recognise something in the environment 
and then allow you to see additional information about, uh, say, an object in the real world, but displayed on your device in real time. And it can even allow you to interact with that and with 3D models in the real world. So it can be really sophisticated or it can be really quite simple. There's travel apps for phones, which are programmed to recognise landmarks and add, say, information about a building or a historical site. And there are apps for furniture stores that will allow you to look through your camera at a room in your own house and place new furniture in your own space, kind of you know, try before you buy. One of my colleagues at Griffith has helped develop a CSI style augmented reality app for the forensic students and it works using QR code stickers. So this is a very simple thing to implement. You can actually place the stickers in a room and the students scan them with their mobile technology and that trig triggers the augment. They get forensic information about a crime that's taken place in the room. So I really can see a huge potential in augmented reality for business. Related to that, of course, is virtual reality, and that's now moving from the world of big full room virtual spaces to small portable headsets like the Oculus Rift. Now, these are currently available as high level prototypes, but word is that the commercial consumer devices will hit the market in the first quarter of 2016. So there's a lot of focus on gaming for virtual devices, but there are business applications as well. Imagine the options you could have for hands-on training or for virtual lectures for formal education or for people to practice skills from the comfort of home simply using a headset that they can put on and carry around with them. That's the Oculus Rift headset that you can see on the slide. And of course there's robotics which can mean anything from science fiction style AI robots to that thing that vacuums your carpet. So just this past weekend, there was a big robotics forum in Brisbane with a huge range of different potential applications. In a simplistic form, robotics have started appearing already as consumer technology, but definitely not in the high-tech form that you know, fiction has always talked about. Work's progressing though. I saw a drummer with a robotic drumming arm. He's the fastest drummer in the world. There's a broad range of applications that you can consider here with everything from assistance technology to recreation, to safety. You can send robots to places where you really wouldn't want to go yourself. So the emerging technologies are really dealing with new devices and options that might be able to support you in both doing your business and in growing your business. So we're talking about physical innovation. Technology isn't just about the hardware though, the, just the devices. It's also brought about a range of different methods and processes and they might be able to help you in the normal conduct of your business as well. One I'm going to look at today is, is Agile. So what is Agile? It's an approach rather than a specific technique. It's a way of doing software development that's steadily gained traction and popularity and it's not just in the IT industry but in other industries as well. So what does it mean to be agile? Does it have something to offer your business? And what do you need to know? So let me give you a bit of a description about what agile is. Agile is light. It values individuals and interactions over processes and tools. That's an agile principle. This just means that you use the level of processes and tools that will best support you. No more and no less. If a process or tool isn't advancing the project, then don't use it. If it helps the project, then make it part of your approach. Flexibility is Agile's bread and butter. Uh, another one of the principles, Agile values, responding to change over following a plan. Now, this doesn't mean that there isn't a plan. It means that you adjust your approach to deal with the needs of this specific project with this specific team. Agile is also responsive, mostly because it's light and flexible. It, that means that the team is able to adapt their approach to suit the needs of the project and they can do so quickly and most importantly with a minimum of stress. Collaboration is core to the Agile approach both within the team and between the team and the client if you deal with one. Client collaboration is built into the Agile manifesto with a specification of another value, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. The client's needs and satisfying the client's vision, that comes first. If you don't have a client as such, then that just means satisfying the needs of your own business. So all of this together means that Agile is best suited to changing environments and changing requirements. That light, flexible, responsive nature of the approach, that means that it takes change in its stride and it adapts. What Agile is known for giving you 
is a faster time to market with a product. That makes all the difference with innovation. It allows you to deal with change. It's brilliant with changing situations and that can also allow you to innovate more freely and be flexible. The fact that it's so responsive means that it can help you align any IT based work that you're doing with your main business rather than having IT sitting off on its own. And of course all of that flexibility that I've been talking about, that makes it ideal for helping you to continuously innovate. Yeah, okay, this all sounds great, but the reality is that Agile isn't for every project or every organisation. It works really well in certain situations based on the problem space, the organisation, the people involved, the organisational culture, that's critical, and the leadership that's involved within that organisation. Implementing the Agile approach generally means a fundamental change in a team's approach and that isn't necessarily an easy thing to do. Now Agile may have started in IT but it's certainly not confined solely to IT anymore. There's a really broad range of industries that have switched all or part of their business to a more Agile style. Probably the most well known here in Queensland would be Suncorp. Now they've switched their entire business across to Agile. There are also some industries that seem to suit the switch better than others. Um, the leaders in this would be marketing, but pretty much any business that produces a product or that needs to be adaptable can look to Agile as an option. If you want to go Agile, then you do need to change. You need to really commit to that change. So what does that mean? Well, for a start, you need to look at the way you manage your business and your work to the kind of culture that your business has. Businesses that already have a flexible structure that give employees a say, these will have the easiest time switching to Agile. Hand in hand with that is the structure of your teams. Agile means multidisciplinary teams. This means teams where all the players can play each other's instruments and fill different roles. Teams are often what we call self-organising. That means the team itself works out what structure will best suit them and what will work best for them. You know your own business and your own team best. If you want to move towards Agile, how do you think your team will cope? You don't have to make these kinds of decisions yourself. You don't have to know everything about Agile straight off the bat. But I do recommend that you arm yourself with as much information as you can, both to decide if this is something that you want to do and to then manage the transition to Agile if you choose to take that leap. There's a difference between adopting Agile and using Agile. The, the factors and the variables that are behind adopting Agile in non-IT areas, that includes things like support from your senior management, support from the business arm if, if you have a separate business arm, and the existing culture that is within your particular company. Now, if your company happens to already have an internal IT department and they've successfully transitioned to Agile, then that really will help the rest of the business transition as well. Now, the factors and the variables for successfully using Agile, things include uh, reinforcement of the new approach, being consistent when you apply your tools and your techniques, actually using Agile tools, properly training your staff, um, making sure you have competent personnel on hand, keeping it all as simple as possible. Unless you're already an Agile expert, this is a lot to try to control and that's where it's a really good idea to get an expert in to help you hire an Agile coach. They can not only have a look at what you're already doing and give you some ideas for whether you want to move in this direction, but they can really help your company to actually make the switch, which feeds in very nicely for collaboration. Now, I've spoken about just a small selection of technical innovations that are either here or coming, and just one of the different approaches that technology has to offer business. Really, there's so much more and you can access them through collaboration with Griffith University. Of course, we're known for traditional research, that's what universities do, but there's more ways to access new information than just that. Now, I'll start with the consultancy option. You have something that you want to look into, a new technology or a new approach, and you want to learn more to see if it's a fit for your organisation or check if there's an opportunity here for you to innovate. You can enter into what we call an external consultancy with people from within the university. Uh, I can give you an example. I'm currently working with a community group to help them develop an app. 
uh, we're looking at what we need the app to do and so they're drawing on my emerging technology ex uh, knowledge and my user experience skills and the research that I've done which is in their specific industry to work out what they need the app to do. So I'm running their requirements and their design process for them as an external consultancy. Now this is just one example, but a consultancy with university really does give you access to cutting edge research and the knowledge of people who are working with this technology every day. You can decide just how much help or support you need. You don't have to run a complete project. You can just choose the areas where you need help. Now, when it comes to the actual applications themselves, then a very tangible collaboration that you can have is through the App Factory. The App Factory is an initiative within the School of ICT at Griffith where I work. You can take a development idea to the App Factory and an industry-based project manager will work with you to scope out your idea and give you a quote on the project. And he then guides a group of high achieving students in completing your project to a commercial standard. And of course he's going to make sure the students deliver on time. Now this is something that the students are doing in addition to their studies. So it's work that can occur at any time, not just during semester. Part of the power of working with students is their own inherent innovation. They can see options and alternatives that you might not have seen, simply because they're really creative and they're not as constrained by expectations as those of us with a few more years under our belts. The external consultancy that I just mentioned, well, once we've got the requirements and the design done, we're going to be handing that over to the App Factory and they're going to produce the final product. If you've got a bit more time or you want something that's outside the app space, then another collaboration option for you is inside our work integrated learning options. Now this is actual coursework that our students complete, it's, but it's based in the real world. I run the industry project course at Nathan and for that I team small groups of students with an industry partner and then essentially mentor them through an academic year as they work out your requirements, design a solution for you, they develop the product, they test it and then they hand it over to you at the end. Now this is on a fixed time frame, uh, it is coursework so the students will work either in a single semester, intensive style, or over two semesters which means they'll run pretty much from March to October. Now through this program I've teamed students up with everything from individual people with an idea for a new piece of technology through to companies looking to see what students are like because they're looking to hire some IT into the company themselves and all the way through to the big organisations in both the private and the public sectors. I've also seen students complete both commercial development and research work. There's, there's a lot of scope to work with here. The second work integrated learning option that we have is called IAP, uh, that's the Industry Affiliates Program. So the industry project offering I was talking about, that's for a team of students who will come out to see you but do most of their work based on the university campus, unless you would like them to work on site for a period of time each week, we can organise that too. The IAP program, it takes an individual student and it places them in your organisation to work with you and your team to complete a small one person project. IAP is run over just a single semester, de but depending on what you need, there is an option for either a two day a week or a four day a week placement through that. So hopefully I've given you something to think about as well as a few options you might not have considered to access the expertise within the university to help you build innovation in your business through working with technology. I recently read a report from uh, Cap Gemini and Ultimeter. They said that the rise in innovation has been triggered by digital Darwinism because organisations are striving to survive and then prosper from digital disruption. So everywhere I look lately I'm seeing people talking about this idea of dis digital disruption. But the problem is, and it said this in this report, that innovation is extremely challenging. So why do it yourself when you can innovate in collaboration? This report also said that the dangerous thing that enterprises do is not look at the full life cycle return on investment and they just focus on a fashion. In reality, each of the new things that I've talked about today means organisational change and cultural change and business model change, but you don't have to do it alone. 
Thank you, Leon, for an informative presentation. It is now time for our Q&A session. So please send through your questions uh, using the text box on the screen and we will answer as many as we can in the remaining minutes. <clears throat> I'll, I'll just kick off as the questions come in. Apart from contacting yourself, Leon, how would a small or medium-sized enterprise contact the university? If you go to the university uh, website, on the front page, there's an actual section there for industry partners, so you can go in there and have a look at those kinds of options. But if you've got a particular area that you're interested in, there are many, many different places within the website that you can search to find information about a specific area of expertise. So there are specific homepages, for instance. So there's a homepage for our school, through, and it's griffith.edu.au slash ICT. It's real easy to find. Um, you can do searches on specific researchers. We have a whole areas of the website dedicated to different researchers and the work that they're doing. Uh, they go to the website. There's a wealth of information there available for you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, question from the panel, from Tyson. Uh, great innovative lecture, Dr. Lee Ellen and Griffith. Curious to know what the costs are. Oh, isn't that always the million dollar question? There is no simple answer to that. Oh, actually, it depends on what you mean by which costs. If you're talking about costs in relation to the collaborations with the university, um, there is only one of the programs that has a cost involved, and that's the IAP program. Um, the others are, that the, through the industry project program, there is no cost for participating in that. The external consultancies are done on a case-by-case -case basis, so it, that will all depend on what you need done. And essentially, once you talk to people, they can give you an idea of how much it's going to cost to have that particular set of expertise do that particular set of work for you. Um, same with the App Factory. It all depends on exactly what it is that you want to have developed. Obviously, if you've just got a very, very simple app, then you can have something developed for a, a really quite small sum of money. If you've got something which is really sophisticated and really advanced, then obviously the price is, is going to go up. Uh, so yeah, it varies depending on exactly which option you're looking at. And I'm guessing this would almost follow on, but if as a business owner I did work with the university to, to collaborate, what happens with the IP? Who owns the intellectual property? We can enter into intellectual property arrangements with you one-on-one, -on -one, and again, it's going to depend on the particular situation. Um, I'll give an example from the industry project program that I run. We have people who come to us with a creative idea for a project that they want developed. They retain the IP to their individual idea. The students retain the IP over any of the original code or development that they produce in order to meet your requirements. But what generally happens with those kinds of programs is that the students enter into an arrangement with you and they grant you a perpetual royalty-free license to use the software. The only time there would ever be any kind of royalty provision or, or transfer of ownership with the intellectual property is if you're looking to develop a product that is then going to be commercialised, that you're going to be making money from. Uh, and as soon as you start getting into those slightly more complex situations, then we start looking at entering into a formal arrangement. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, another question from the panel from Roman. Do students get paid for the projects within IAP, the Industry Affiliates Program? That varies. Um, most of our partners don't um, pay the students. They pay to have a student placed in their organisation. Uh, they pay a fee to the IAP office and then that covers their, the insurance for the students' work and that sort of thing, but they don't pay the students themselves. Having said that, a number of companies do choose to pay their students as, as interns, essentially. That's something that's very much done on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, in some cases, we have students who are already doing some sort of work with a company, in which case they just continued that, doing that work and become part of the program. Uh, yeah, it's it's case by case, it varies. Thank you very much. Uh, we might have to put a scenario around this next question from Jenny. Uh, how fast can you deploy? I'm guessing that's meaning in a collaboration sense as the IAP and the work integrated learning programs are on the semester basis. So I think we'll take it as a sort of a collaboration scenario. 
Yes, uh, because as I said, with industry project and IAP, those are confined to the semester deadlines. So they run during semesters and, and those are our time constraints. For any of the other options that I was talking about, well, essentially it, it just all comes down to availability. If you wanted to enter into an external consultancy, then so long as the person you wish to work with is in a position to start, then you can start straight away. Uh, if you are looking at uh, the App Factory, a lot of the time we can also start those particular developments with a really quick turnaround as well. The caveat though, with the App Factory you'll tend to get the reverse of industry project and IAP. If you're getting towards the end of a semester when students have got a lot of assessment due, that might be a time when they're less available to do work through the App Factory. So uh, it depends on what it is that you want to do and which particular collaboration you wish to gear up with. Sounds like the message I'm hearing is to contact us and we'll work something out. <laughs> uh, another question from Cheryl. Uh, if I wanted to look for an agile coach, what qualifications would I be looking for? In relation to that, you're going to be looking for proper certifications and it may depend, if you've already got an idea of the particular flavour of Agile that you want to implement. People often think that Agile is just this one overarching technique and it's not. There's a lot of different ways that you can implement Agile. So for example, one way is that people, a lot of people know about is Scrum. So if you're looking to hire in an Agile coach and you know that that's the kind of approach you wish to use, then you look for people who are already Scrum certified. In order to be an Agile coach, you have to be a Scrum certified uh, practitioner. So look at people's certifications, look at their experience, look at the work that they've already done, look if they've already done this kind of work as an Agile coach. Um, look for references from other people who have already worked with them, all the, you know, the, the standard processes. But in terms of certification, look to see that they've got the certification in the approach that they're trying to train you in. And what is a Scrum? Okay, Scrum is a particular Agile technique and it's probably the one that's most widely known in industry and it is named after a rugby Scrum because it's the idea of a group of people who work together as a team and are pushing towards a common goal. Actually describing exactly what Scrum is as a methodology from start to finish probably requires an entirely new webinar. Um, it, I could easily fill another half hour explaining exactly what it is. But essentially you're talking about development that takes place in iterations. The iterations are what we call time boxed. That means they take place over a set frame to time frame that is a short time frame. They're called sprints. If people tell you they're doing six month sprints, then they're not doing agile. Um, and it work progressive iteratively. The teams themselves have specific roles. The head of the team is a scrum master. There's another person on the team who's a product owner. I could keep going. <laughs> um, it's, it's a specific agile approach and it has its own set of artifacts and rules as to how that takes place. Uh, well, keeping on the agile uh, theme, so if I went to agile, can I throw out all my Gantt charts? <laughs> Um, well, you could throw out all your Gantt charts, but there is that whole thing about throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Um, some people think that because you're following Agile, you no longer have to do any planning. And that's, it's just not the case. It's just that the planning has changed. So you might not have the same formal level of tools available to you. Things are often done in a more informal fashion that particularly to outsiders can look really ad hoc. Um, for instance, instead of having the formal Gantt chart that you spend months creating, what you'll actually have is a chart drawn up on a whiteboard that you can change with like five minutes notice with an eraser and a marker. The whole idea with Agile is that long-term planning is done at a very high level, short-term planning is done in detail. The approach is meant to be flexible and changeable, so you don't want to spend all this time planning everything out in detail from the, for the long term when you could make a decision in 10 minutes time that will change everything. So that's wasted effort. You concentrate your planning efforts on the short term. So no, I wouldn't recommend completely throwing the Gantt charts away, but you might be deploying them in a slightly different fashion. Thank you. Uh, we seem to have a theme here. Uh, do you have some examples of costs? Uh, understanding that things can be different and there possibly could be around some questions that you're not being forthcoming with commercial and confidence, um, but I'm imagining that perhaps if we could keep it sort of aligned to maybe industry expectations. 
No, absolutely, that's fine. I can give some, some tangible examples um, based on my own practice. Um, uh, costs will often vary from client to client because it depends on what they need, obviously. But to give a really broad brushstroke example, uh, if you were going to do a full uh, usability evaluation, you wanted to gather requirements, you wanted to run focus groups, you wanted to then analyse all of those and, and develop a list of requirements as an external consultancy. Uh, you're looking at between $750 to $1,500 for a session. What influences what end of the scale you come in at is how much of the legwork you will do yourself and how much you want us to do for you. Uh, so for instance, as a usability consultant, I can go out and I can screen participants for you and I can invite them all in and I can handle all of the room hire and booking and catering. And the more of that that you ask me to do, that sort of administrative stuff, then obviously the higher the cost is going to become. But if you want to pair it back so that you're just focusing on my expertise in terms of actually running the focus groups and analysing the information and coming up with the requirements and you take over that at the administrative function, then you can bring the cost down. So there's, there's an actual tangible example of a cost. Um, app Factory. If you're looking for a very simple, straightforward app, there is, and please don't quote me on this because Dylan will kill me. Uh, there's a really ballpark estimate that you can use that for a very simple app, you can generally look to have something ready to go at a commercial level, very simple and basic for about 10 grand. Obviously, the more complicated you want it to be, the more functionality it has, if you want it to deploy to different platforms, for instance, you want it to be available on Android and iPhone and, you know, and, and go to the new Microsoft phones as well. As soon as you start adding in those levels of complexity, of course, your costs are going to go up. But hopefully that helps as well, giving a couple of actual costs that I can brand on things. Thanks. Uh, more follow-up from Ro Roman uh, with his IAP students. Do the businesses get to choose which students will, will participate in their projects? That's a great question. For IAP, yes. IAP actually works very much like, almost like a traditional hiring situation. What you register with your project with IAP, the IAP office then publish that list through to the students and the students apply for the projects that they're actually interested in. You then get to have a look at the short list of the students that are available and you can interview them yourself before you bring them into your business and, and place them with you. The industry project program is a little different. Um, in some cases we have clients who do have some input into who's working with them, but in the most part uh, it's the conveners of the course who work out which groups they're going to put together and what client they're going to pair the group with, simply because that process has, there's a lot more technicality going in to making sure that you've got a team which has the right balance of skills for the project, um, to making sure you've got a team that everyone in the project is at the right level to actually deal with the, the level of complexity, um, to looking at uh, the suitability for, from particular backgrounds and, and study areas. And that's not something that we would expect an industry partner to be across. That's our job. So for the industry project program, you're more likely to um, be given a team. With IAP, you've got to say as to which student you have. Thank you very much for that information. That's all the time we have for questions today. On behalf of CCIQ and Griffith University, I'd like to thank Dr. Lee Ellen Potter from the School of Information and Communication Technology for taking the time to present today. I'd also like to thank everyone involved, everyone who has joined us for the session today. If you have any further questions for Lee Ellen, you can contact her using the information on the screen. If you'd like to find out more about our, our research in engineering, IT and science, go to our Impact at Griffith Sciences website and subscribe and engage. Don't forget that CCIQ has a range of webinar events, sorry, webinars and events coming up over the next few months, including 20 key social media tips to drive traffic to your online store on the 26th of August, and fraud, not just another F word, 4th of, on the 4th of September. If you want to know more about upcoming events, go to the CCIQ events page to, and book your place. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Damien Harris from Griffith University and I look forward to welcome, welcoming you to another CCIQ webinar in the very near future.